Cameraman husband Dave and I live about 40 miles from our capital and we know the popular spots quite well. But we find the more you learn about the city, the more you want to see. London film, we've discovered a selection of quirky, interesting and historic places that you may have heard about but haven't had a chance to visit. This area is the naughty bit of London and I love it. This is where all the pirates were, um, this is where all the brothels were. So if you want to see the other side of London, the dark side, come to Rotherhive. Right, so come down, meet the pearly kings and queens, see what the old London tradition is. You can see us all in our different costumes, wonderful stalls, wonderful tradition, and we'd all like to see you in Brick Lane. I like the history of London. It has a really rich history of popular entertainment, and I sort of feel this fits, because as a cartoonist, I like all the 18th century cartoonists who mercilessly poke fun at the king and the politicians. And I like to think if they were alive today, they would do something a bit similar. This is the sort of hobby that got out of control. Really. Thomas Twain then started to do very, very well in his business as a whole, and tea was really what was taking off. And by 1717, we had a doorway onto the Strand. And this is referred to as the Golden Lions. It meant that everybody knew that Twinings was the place to go and actually get your tea from. Our first outing is to the infamous Fleet Street. There are several tube stations that serve it, but we've chosen Blackfriars, which is just a few hundred yards away. Fleet Street was once considered the most important location for printing and journalism in the world, with Britain's national newspapers making the street their home for centuries. Dave and I are taking a walk through history, which began many centuries before, and we might well discover a pub or two on the way. This street was established as a thoroughfare to Roman Londinium, whose walls enclosed an area roughly the size of the city of London. These walls can still be seen not far from here. By around AD 200, there was fair evidence that this was a major route leading west away from the city gate. At the fall of the Roman Empire, Londinium was abandoned by the Saxons, who created Ludenvik in the area now known as Aldwych and the Strand. Fleet Street, nevertheless, retained its importance as a thoroughfare. In medieval times, it became lined with houses, shops and taverns, with gardens and yards behind. Narrow lanes subsequently developed behind those, which gradually evolved into a network of alleys or courts as they became known. By the 13th century, Fleet Street was flanked by ecclesiastical land, notably the buildings of the Knights Templar, based around the new temple to the south. Today, the Inns of Court, London's centre for the Law Society, still remain. The time-locked lanes and tucked-away squares have witnessed some of the most important events in English history. Sadly, though, we don't have permission to film. But that's another undiscovered place for you to explore.
In spite of the continuous development, almost unbelievably, most of the original medieval courts, lanes and alleys have remained intact, rebuilt around the same pattern after the Great Fire of London. So when did this famous street start its long history of printing? Our history books tell us that the printing press came from Europe to England with William Caxton in 1476, but his talented apprentice, Vincan de Vorde, should be recognised for ensuring its continued success. After Caxton died, Vincan took over his business in Westminster and then moved to this lane just off Fleet Street in 1500. He was the first printer to come to Fleet Street, with a ready-made customer base on his doorstep, the church and the legal fraternity, Vincan was able to produce many titles, in fact more than 800 publications in his time. He also improved the quality of Caxton's product a great deal and is regarded as England's first typographer, bringing lower priced books to a mass market. He used the sign of the sun as a trademark on his work. Dave and I stroll down Bouvery Street to find Magpie Alley, or Magpie Murals as it has been called. Tiled on its walls is a fascinating timeline of images and maps, all relating to the development of printing and the press. Here is a map of Fleet Street in De Vorda's day. Further down the alley, you can see the remains of the Whitefriars Carmelite Monastery, carefully preserved behind glass, incorporated into foundations on the site of the former News of the World building. Fleet Street contains many styles of architecture, representing hundreds of years of change and development. Perhaps the most distinctive is this wonderful half-timbered frontage from 1610, which contains a gateway to the inner temple. Behind me is one of the few buildings left untouched by the Great Fire of London of 1666, Prince Henry's room. This is where the eldest son of King James I, Henry of Wales, had a room set aside on the first floor as his council chamber in this one-time tavern. The appearance today owes much to the restoration in 1905, after removing a 19th century facade which had concealed this wonderful timbered frontage. Prince Henry's room was acquired by the Samuel Pepys Club as a museum in which they display memorabilia of this famous diarist who was born on Fleet Street. In just 10 years, he wrote his very personal diaries, chronicling both the Great Plague and the Fire of London. Not surprisingly, our time trail involves a pub, of which there are still a fair number down Fleet Street, many of which were frequented by journalists in the centuries to come. Down Wine Office Court, our chosen hostelry is Ye Old Cheshire Cheese, which suffered damage from the Fire of London in 1666. It was rebuilt the following year and appears to have been open ever since. Quite possibly, it's London's most famous pub and has been around since the days of Samuel Pepys and Christopher Wren, nourishing such luminaries as Samuel Johnson and Charles Dickens. Because it's situated on Fleet Street, there are many literary associations with the Cheshire Cheese. It's been described and quoted in many novels over the centuries, even before the first newspaper arrived. The pub's unique and wonderfully gloomy interior sprawls out over at least four levels. The dungeon-like lower vaults are by far the oldest part and are thought to belong to a 13th century Carmelite monastery which once occupied the site. The pub is currently owned and operated by the Samuel Smith Brewery and the range of food and drink is straightforward and inexpensive. With maybe a dozen rooms, no phone signal and to confuse things further, a pub of similar name 500 yards away, this is about as challenging a rendezvous point as any in London. This is turning out to be a pub crawl, isn't it? It's always a pub crawl. 
If you look carefully above the right-hand bar as you come in, you'll see Polly, a stuffed African grey parrot. For around 40 years, she lived and squawked in ye old Cheshire cheese. Polly's popularity, particularly with newspaper men, was her ability to speak obscenities, with F*** the Kaiser rumoured to be the favourite. The fame of the Fleet Street parrot was so widespread that on her death in 1926, around 200 newspapers across the world wrote an obituary. Often referred to as the Cathedral of Fleet Street, St Bride's Church was also the victim of the Great Fire. Like nearby St Paul's Cathedral, it was also rebuilt to designs by Sir Christopher Wren. The famous steeple stands 226 feet high and is said to have inspired the creation of the multi-tiered wedding cake by a local baker. The original Old Bell Tavern was built as a hostel by Wren to house his workers who were engaged to rebuild St Bride's. At the western end of Fleet Street is the statue of a griffin marking the start of the City of London. Previously on this site was the Temple Bar, also built by Wren to restrict horse-drawn traffic down the busy thoroughfare. So how did Fleet Street acquire its name? Well, at the eastern end, there is a natural dip in the landscape. This was once the course of the notorious River Fleet, flowing down to the Thames from the health ponds on Hampstead Heath. Today it's known as one of the lost rivers of London, but still exists underground. Joined by other tributaries and sewage tunnels beautifully crafted in brick by the Victorians, the river's odour still wafts up from the pavements from time to time. The fleet meets the Thames under Blackfriars Bridge, but you can't see it even if you really wanted to, because a new sewage system is being developed below it. The birth of the modern newspaper can be traced to a house that once stood just about here on the eastern bank of the fetid river fleet from 1702, overlooking the sewage, dead dogs and suicide victims that clogged the waterway, England's first daily newspaper press, the Daily Courant, thumped, clanged and squelched out the news to the city's eager citizens. It was just one product of a media revolution at the dawn of the 18th century. After the abolition of pre-publication censorship laws, a prolific newspaper press had burst into life. By the mid-1730s, 31 newspapers were being hawked on the streets of London. Journalists were free to criticise government policy or satirise the church without ending up in jail. The press boom had created a news frenzy, and London now boasted the biggest, freest and most profitable press in the world. Fleet Street was perfectly placed between the city, the law courts and Westminster for its reporters to gather news. Stories were exchanged in the numerous coffee shops and alehouses down its narrow alleyways. One man associated with the literary trade was Dr Samuel Johnson, who with the help of others compiled the very first English dictionary. His 300-year-old rented home on Gough Square is now run by a partner of the National Trust and you can visit this magnificently restored townhouse. It contains a research library, restored interiors and a wealth of original features. It's a hidden gem in a wonderfully quiet spot, not far from the bustle of Fleet Street. Across the square is a statue of Hodge, Dr Johnson's beloved cat, sat on a dictionary, remembered as a very fine cat indeed. St Dunstan's Church on Fleet Street was also spared damage from the Great Fire of London and is loaded with many historical artefacts. Its frontage is hemmed in by ex-newspaper offices, all jostling for position on London's notorious thoroughfare. Now, number 186 is a rather infamous address from the past. This is where, in the late 18th century, you could get your hair cut and probably a very close shave. 
because this was the premises of the demon barber of Fleet Street, Sweeney Todd. He set up a barber's shop here with the famous revolving chair, allowing his victims to be ejected into the basement below. In his time, the evil Sweeney Todd robbed and slit the throats of over 150 customers right under the noses of the press and the law courts. With his lover and accomplice Marjorie Lovett, he unearthed a monastery tunnel leading from the cellar of his barber's shop beneath St Dunstan's Church and ending under Bell Yard at Mrs Lovett's pie shop. It was said at the time, Oh, those delicious pies! There was about them a flavour never surpassed and rarely equalled. The paste was of the most delicate construction and impregnated with the aroma of delicious gravy that defied description. This grim tale was first serialised in a Fleet Street Penny Dreadful news sheet and became a staple of Victorian melodrama and London urban legend. It was all utter fiction. Right next to Bell Yard stands the old Bank of England, still looking for all the world like a financial institution. Dave suggests we go inside for refreshment. This is a must-see when you visit this part of London. Two taverns were demolished in 1888 to make way for the construction of the Law Courts branch of the Bank of England. They traded here for 87 years until 1975 when the premises were sold to a building society. In 1994, London brewers Fuller, Smith & Turner took over the lease and began a major refurbishment with the aim of restoring the splendid building to its former glory. We take a look at the menu, but decide to eat later. But what many visitors don't know about lies below the magnificent bar room. The old Bank of England's basement still contains the original vaults used to store bullion and indeed some of the crown jewels during the First World War. Whilst two of the huge strong rooms have now been changed to hold the cellars and kitchens, the main vault is intact and still contains the huge steel bullion cupboards. These days the contents are treasures of an alcoholic nature. In the mid-19th century, after various newspaper taxes were abolished, Prices on the street were slashed, and the success of the industry dramatically increased. Look at Fleet Street in 1890. It's yeah. still as busy. <laughs> well, it's even busier if you ask me. Chucker. By the 20th century, Fleet Street was known as a national and international centre for journalism. Papers like The Times, Express, Telegraph had become huge concerns. The Sun allegedly took its name from Vink and Devorda's trademark. Famous journalists like T.P. O'Connor and Edgar Wallace are remembered in the street. By the 1930s, the majority of British households bought a daily paper produced from here. Prosperous publishers built wonderful palaces along each side. The Daily Telegraph edifice was designed by Charles Elcock and must have been seen as bold, modern and thrusting when it was built in 1928. Above the entrance are winged messengers spreading Britain's news to the globe. Higher still, the incredibly ornate clock 
tells the time to the whole street. Several doors down is the Daily Express building. Now some people think of it as one of London's sexiest buildings. Other people think of it as a brooding harbinger of something bad. Whatever your thoughts, it's Grade 2 listed and was built in 1932. Designed by Ellison Clark in vitrolite and clear glass, it's one of the most prominent examples of Art Deco architecture in London. There's so much history in Fleet Street, and most of the alleys or courts still remain. The enticing, tightly knit network of back streets around Fleet Street had become the embodiment of the British press and were notorious as much as the bustling offices full of hacks as it was for the numerous smoky alehouses frequented by them. It's such a pleasure now to read the plaques of where the great British newspapers once published to millions of readers. But technology has a habit of breaking with tradition. With new electronic methods, Fleet Street's demise began in 1986, when Rupert Murdoch declared operating from here was no longer profitable. He moved publication of his News International titles, The Times, News of the World and The Sun, to new premises in Wapping, and electronic printing began. The following year, the Telegraph left its mock Egyptian palace for Canary Wharf. In 1988, the Daily Mail made the move to West London. Today, the street is a pale imitation of its former self, and the prestige printing offices have been taken over by new companies. But it's testament to the impact of the 18th century media boom that Fleet Street endures as a symbol for the newspaper industry, even though no newspaper is published here. Well, not quite. Scottish publisher DC Thompson still runs a publicity office on the site of Sweeney Todd's Barbershop, number 186. They still promote their historic and most popular comic, The Beano, which has entertained children with Dennis the Menace, Minnie the Minx and Roger the Dodger since 1938. Well, we're getting a bit hungry and Dave's not keen on pies right now. Or getting a haircut, for that matter. Well, that's about it for Fleet Street. Yeah, and what a really interesting day it was. It was. I think we should finish our pub crawl before we go back to Blackfriars Station. <laughs> yes, well then, can we go to the Art Deco pub? I've always wanted to go opposite. I reckon we can. It's rush hour now, and with hordes of commuters heading towards the station, we make a beeline for the Blackfriars. It's only 6.30 on a Monday, but already it's crowded. The Grade 2 listed public house was built in around 1875 on the site of a former medieval Dominican friary. It was remodelled in about 1905 by the architect Herbert Fuller Clark. The beautiful building was almost demolished during redevelopment in the 1960s until it was saved by a campaign spearheaded by Poet Laureate Sir John Betjeman. We order fish and chips and start to plan our next outing. Dave and I have come to explore another undiscovered area, starting at Hoban Tube Station just outside London's Theatreland. Our first stop is an extraordinary place, crammed with unique and very odd creations. It's only a five or six minute walk along High Hoban to our first destination. We pass by Red Lion Square. Named after the local Red Lion Inn nearby, this rather hidden public space has an intriguing history. It's quite possibly the resting place of Oliver Cromwell's body, but maybe not his head. And sightings of his ghost have been reported. The square was built in the late 17th century by an early property speculator. 
but with fierce opposition, the one-time fields became the scene of a pitched battle during construction. Later, one of the properties became the home of William Morris and Dante Gabriel Rossetti for a while. We turn into Princeton Street. Well, this is it. Looks intriguing. Novelty Automation's creator and engineer, Tim Hunkin, describes his Tudor-fronted premises as a new London arcade of satirical homemade machines. He started his first seaside arcade, the Under the Pier Show, at Southwold in 2001 with a missionary zeal to reinvent amusement arcades. This soon became a great success and he had also run out of space. So he opened this new adventure here on Princeton Street, which contains most of his recent work. I like the history of London. It has a really rich history of popular entertainment. And I sort of feel this fits, because as a cartoonist, I like all the 18th century cartoonists who mercilessly poked fun at the king and the politicians. And I like to think if they were alive today, they would do something a bit similar. So uh, I sort of feel I fit here. Yes. <laughs> trained as an engineer. I sort of think like an engineer. This is a sort of hobby that got out of control, really. <laughs> well, this is the earliest one here, and this one had a, a quite a big effect on me because um, I made it for a place in Covent Garden. And when I was making it, I really wasn't sure if people would be prepared to take their shoe off and put it into a dark hole at the bottom. <laughs> I thought, I thought it, you know, people are funny about their feet. And I was thrilled when they did. And it made me realise that People underestimate coin-operated machines because the, the thing is, once you put your money in, you've invested, and then you want to get your money's worth. So you really you read the instructions really carefully, and, and you give it your full attention. This machine is partly why I got so hooked. <laughs> Position foot in the treatment bay. So I had to this lot. She's looking at it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, what's she doing? Something's, something's happening on my foot. <laughs> oh, that was very strange. This looks appropriate for London, Tim. Money laundry? Yeah, this is the money laundering machine. Um, uh, you're right, this is part of the fun of opening here, is that there were lots more themes about London that yeah. I could explore. So you've got all this cash down in the gutter and you have to use the tower crane um, to get the cash into the bank, the weighing scales on top there. Right. But th here, over here you have the Financial Conduct Authority, the regulators, <laughs> and if they see the cash going up, they look out their windows, um, then it, you lose it and you have to start all over again. Uh, it's not a very difficult game, but um, we actually have people from the Financial Conduct Authority come and play it. And uh, their comment is that I've made it too difficult, that in real life it's a lot easier. But uh, so yeah, it's definitely part of the City of London, yeah. this machine. I've always wanted to go on a nuclear reactor, so here we go. Right, so I have some fuel. I think I'm going to try to get it in there. Oh! Okay, for evacuation. Oh, look. Radioactive sweet. Okay, Dad, you've got to try this. Come on. I'm not sure about this. And I have to put my hand in the cage and push that button. But I'm nervous. Now I'm normal.
break the two or three minute all-inclusive package holiday um, and this is the first one that I used video it sort of it came sort of just about simple enough to add video about 2000 so about 18 years ago and um, this is when I was opening the my arcade on the pier and I had a bit more space so um, it's a sort of simulator ride and it sort of impressed me it, uh, just how much more involving it makes it because you're moving around while you watch it. Yeah. It came about just because I was arguing with my wife about going on holiday. I'm not good at going on holiday. <laughs> I'm ready for this. I've been working hard and I need a break. Oh, yes. So I've got to press the start button. And... Welcome aboard flight Air B44 to Costa Valente. Enjoy your flight. Captain Hunkin speaking. We are currently cruising at 37,000 feet. The weather in Costa Valente is sunny and very warm. We have a strong tailwind today, so we expect to be landing in just a few seconds. Thank you for choosing Micro Break. You will now be transferring to a coach to take you to your final destination. Mainstream arcades are rather out of fashion at the moment, um, so they need reinventing. <laughs> so, I don't know, mine are rather one eccentric one-offs, but uh, I think they may come back. Tim's success as an engineer, cartoonist and entertainer is celebrated every day in a visitor's book, crammed full of praise. Well, what do you make of that then? That was money well spent. A guaranteed laugh. I think there's a bit of Tim in all of us blokes. He puts daft ideas into practice and really makes them work. We move on to Bedford Row, an exquisite Georgian street in the centre of London's legal heartland. Many of the addresses here are of distinguished barristers, for the street is very close to Gray's Inn one of London's four Inns of Court. Dave and I are in the Bloomsbury district, both a residential and professional quarter of London. Many societies and other organisations have secured leases in the elegant Georgian terraces, and it has also become a favourite neighbourhood for surveyors, solicitors, dentists and other professionals. 
The blue plaque on one of these houses depicts Doughty Street's most famous resident. Now, number 48 is a really interesting place. It's the Charles Dickens Museum. It's where the author wrote Oliver Twist, Pickwick Papers, Nicholas Nickleby, and it's also where he first achieved international fame as one of the world's greatest storytellers. Dickens and his wife Catherine moved here a few months before Queen Victoria began her reign in 1837. The couple raised the eldest three of their ten children in the house. They also hosted many of the period's leading figures with dinners and parties. Here you can discover the private world behind the author's public image and see his study, his desk, handwritten drafts from the novels he wrote, the family bedchambers and the servants' quarters below stairs. We walk on past the Good Enough College and over the Gray's Inn Road to find our next destination. Now this doesn't look much like a visitor attraction. It's called Mount Pleasant and it's the Royal Mail's biggest centre in London. But just down this street are two wonderful places to spend a couple of hours. In its heyday, it was one of the largest sorting offices in the world, but these days the site has gradually become underused. However, Royal Mail have sponsored clever new visitor attractions into their oversized premises. First off, Dave and I call in at the Postal Museum on one side of the street. It was opened in 2017 with a sizeable cafe and gift shop. It's all run by the Postal Heritage Trust, with an eye to entertain children and adults alike, with interactive displays revealing the surprising and fascinating story of Britain's first social network. The Ground Floor Museum displays a lively and colourful 500-year timeline of Britain's postal service, from the first Postmaster General appointed by Henry VIII to the present day. This is the famous Penny Black. It's a registration sheet and then there's the original master die in there. Quite something. Not everyone knows that the first pillar boxes were painted green. Now, of course, I never miss a chance to dress up. The Titanic had 3,000 male sacks on board when she struck an iceberg. But the Postal Service didn't just sort envelopes and parcels. So I've written my message. This is a pneumatic system that was used between the Central Telegraphic Office and the Stock Exchange and Parliament. So I'm going to send a message to someone. Unfortunately, there's no one at the receiving end. There it goes. For a long time, the post office ran Britain's telephone service. All through the war, the mail got through with heroic tales to tell. Here's an interactive exhibit involving the telegram. The last one was sent in 1982. It's all very endearing and a very pleasant way of learning about our postal history. Just think, this is the journey of a letter. A room is set aside for temporary exhibitions and on our visit, Voices from the Deep 
chronicles the tale of SS Gesopper, which was sunk in 1941, just before it reached the shores of Britain. In 2012, the wreck was discovered and revealed hundreds of letters never delivered to their destinations. As vital to the British war effort as the ship's cargo of silver, tea and iron, these letters bring to light the hopes and frustrations of life in India during the Second World War. If you want to find out more about the in-depth history of the Postal Service and study original archive material on display in the Discovery Room, it's all on the first floor of the museum, this time with free entry. Now if you opt to buy the full museum ticket, you can cross the road and enter the highly popular Mail Rail exhibition. Opened in 2017, it now preserves the heritage of London's underground mail delivery network. Our ticket is timed for a ride on a Bijou postal train at 16.30, so Dave and I have enough time to look at the other exhibits first. On display is a model of a travelling post office carriage used on night trains across the country, picking up and dropping off mailbags at high speed. I have a go at sorting. All right, love. All right. Oh, I've dropped it quickly. It's getting fast. When the post office mail rail was launched in 1927, the ingenious little trains ran on electric lines, swiftly collecting mail from London's major railway stations and bringing it here to the Mount Pleasant sorting office. Built like an oversized model railway, it was remotely operated with no drivers. On this mock-up, I try to get the hang of all the interlocks, signals and power outages to move the little train. The line linked Paddington Station through major sorting offices on Oxford Street, Mount Pleasant and through the city to Liverpool Street Station and on to Whitechapel. The 220 staff working on the six and a half mile route helped cut the journey time for mail carts from two to three hours to just 30 minutes. At its peak, the line delivered up to four million letters per day. But with an increased use of electronic mail, there became a global decline in letter writing and mail rail was finally closed in 2003. With a quick look at the introductory movie, our 16.30 departure is now due. Two new miniature trains have been purpose-built. Each carry 32 passengers for 15 minutes on a specially prepared section of the original mail rail tunnels. But there is a difference. We have a driver. Looking forward to this. Okay, we're off. It's just really small in here. <laughs> now we're down to the tunnel. Hello and welcome to Mail Rail. You're about to explore some of London's hidden underground postal railway. I'm Andy, your guide today. Ladies and gentlemen, please do not lean against the doors or the canopies as this will stop the train from moving. Thank you. This unique narrow gauge railway was designed to carry mail, not people. So if you're feeling a little cramped, that's why. And although we have a driver today, the original mail trains were driverless. It was a huge network of automated electric trains running right under central London, carrying mail between main railway stations and sorting offices much faster than along the congested streets above our heads. much as it did on the day it shut down in 2003. When railroad was running on this platform, would be a hive of activity. You'd see people playing darts between the trains arriving, guys conversing back and forth and wheeling work up and down. It was a noisy and lively place to work. The projections on the station walls are stunning. I'll tell you two things that sum up the 70s. Postcodes made life a lot easier 
and strikes made life not so easy. In the 50s, air travel became much more common, and so did air mail, and that meant even more of it traveled along mail rail. The railway was bombed several times. This station suffered the most damage when it was hit in 1943. Amazingly, the railway was back up and running the very next day. That reflected how vital the railway had become. The tunnel off to the left leads to Liverpool Street Station, where mail was transferred to the main railway network. Further down that tunnel, it looks like a maintenance crew is checking the flood barriers. During the railway's construction, ten men scrambled to safety when the nearby river fleet broke into where they were digging. I love it. I think this is brilliant. Okay. I love the smell as well. It's got very yeah. authentic. Yeah. With ticket sales booming at the Postal Museum, this part of undiscovered London will soon be on the major attractions list. Wow, that was fantastic. That was absolutely brilliant. Dave and I have arrived at Liverpool Street Station, the starting point for exploring Spitalfields and Shoreditch areas. On the agenda today, because it's a Sunday, are the fabulous street markets in this part of London. This is also the beginning of the East End, historically the poorest part of the city, with different sets of immigrants arriving here to try and make a new home. These days, the sprawl of modern office blocks and flats is starting to encroach on the East End, and with it comes a level of gentrification. Our first stop is Petticoat Lane, only a few hundred yards from Liverpool Street. Traditionally, it's always been a clothes market. Dealers congregated here centuries ago, selling all types of clothing, including underwear and, of course, silk petticoats. Jewish immigrants settled in the area and became closely involved with the rag trade as it became known. There isn't a street actually called Petticoat Lane anymore. In the mid-19th century, the Victorian authorities renamed it Middlesex Street in an attempt to disassociate it from the rag trade and its impoverished past. It's also possible the authorities were being a bit prudish about underwear. Anyway, it didn't work. We all still know it as Petticoat Lane. With hundreds of stalls lining the streets on a Sunday, bargain hunters come in their droves. It's a great scene and worth the trip, even if you're not shopping. As well as regular clothing bargains, you can buy anything from leatherware, street cred clubwear, to overorders of designer goods and last year's must-haves. As usual, Dave hurries me through. We've got plenty left to visit in this fascinating corner of London. Heading north, the streets take on military titles. Named after the Guild of Artillery of longbows, crossbows and handguns, these streets are a good example of how London must have looked hundreds of years ago. 
old London at its best, I think. It is, yeah. the narrow houses and doorways, or sash windows. We're approaching the Spitalfields area, which had become the home of French Calvinist immigrants, or Huguenots, who were persecuted in their staunchly Catholic country in the late 17th century. Many made a living weaving and trading fine silkware in the district. A few of their shop fronts remain, along with a soup kitchen for the Jewish immigrants who arrived from countries like Russia and Poland during Victorian times. Whilst admiring the old shop signs, we notice some examples of street art here and there, one of which depicts a grim reminder that Jack the Ripper once trod these streets. The unknown Whitechapel murderer claimed all of his victims in this area, one of which was Mary Jane Kelly. An impoverished prostitute, she'd been taken in to the Providence Row Night Refuge and Convent here, where she lived until November 1888. It was then that the Ripper brutally murdered her in a room nearby. You can take a guided walking tour that will follow the murderer's gruesome trail through the district. The Ten Bells pub is one of the stops and is where prostitutes of the area used to congregate of an evening. Mary Jane Kelly used to socialise here, along with another of the Ripper's victims, Annie Chapman. She was seen drinking here on the night before her death. Over the road from the pub is our next market stop, Spitalfields. Love it or hate it, it's completely different from Petticoat Lane, along with products and prices which suit the clientele from the ever-encroaching city. The original Victorian buildings, the market hall and roof, have all been restored, and Spitalfields is now one of London's major markets. Some might say that perhaps too much of this historic site has been given over to developing modern offices. The original market for fruit and vegetables was established as far back as 1682 under a license granted by Charles II. The present buildings, that haven't been demolished, were put up in the late 19th century. The modern market is open for antiques and vintage on a Thursday, fashion and art on a Friday, and for just about everything else is today a Sunday. Overseeing the whole of the multicultural Spitalfields is the elegant but austere Christchurch. It was built in the early 18th century, probably as a reminder to the Calvinist residents from France that the Church of England was most important. Dave and I stroll on down Fournier Street towards our third Sunday market. There's you and me 15 years ago. And the rest. On either side are elegant houses, now beautifully restored. They were first occupied by the Huguenots, who enjoyed a quite lucrative lifestyle weaving silk. Over the years, cheap imports from the docks caused the bottom to fall from the industry, and the houses became squalid apartments and sweatshops. When Jewish refugees arrived, a different community evolved in the East End, bringing with them a very distinct culture. As we approach Brick Lane, there is evidence of a newer community in the district. The Jam Masjid Mosque is the only place of worship in the UK to have embraced all of the successive waves of immigrants, English and French Christians, Jews and now Muslims. The Bangladeshi settled here during the second half of the 20th century, fleeing from civil unrest in what was then East Pakistan. We turn into the south of Brick Lane and walk straight into the heart of Bangla Town, an Asian take on London's Chinatown lined with lively curry houses and food shops. Brick Lane must be at least half a mile long.
as we approach the north end, the atmosphere changes and the Sunday market begins. We've arranged to meet a group of costermongers, former East End market traders. They're all members of the pearly Kings and Queens of London Society. And you can't miss them. Happy birthday, dear. Hello. Doreen, can you tell us about the history of this area and the people that lived here? Certainly. Well, it's changed over the years. I moved away over 50 years ago. I came under slum clearance in the 60s, where they knocked down all the little Victorian houses and moved everybody away into the high-rise, which was the thing in the 60s. But this area has always been a market. You've always had different immigrants. You've had the, well, going as far back in Spitalfields, the Huguenots, and you've also had the uh, Irish, the Jewish community, and now you've got uh, mainly Bangladesh people down the market now. But we try to uphold the old London tradition, which is the pearly kings and queens, which has all started in the late Victorian era and going into the Edwardian era. Shoreditch and Spitalfields and Brick Lane, very gentrified now. Okay. Uh, yeah. All the stalls, artisans, craftsmen, uh, so it's not a market for fruit and vegetables, which is what the costermongers were of originally. Right. And it's very, very nice down here. People flock down here. And of course, you can't be at Salt Beef Bargo on a Sunday morning. <laughs> It's a chaotic, bustling, artistic hub which attracts a lot of young Londoners in search of second-hand furniture, unusual clothes and bric-a-brac. The joy of this market is that you never know what you'll find. The stalls, shops and bars are grouped around the old Truman Brewery which had its origins in the 17th century. Even Charles Dickens quoted it in his book David Copperfield. In the 1960s, Truman was the second largest brewery in the UK, with slogans like, there are more hops in a Ben Truman. Although the brewery fell into decline and subsequently closed in 1989, the premises have now been converted into over 200 units. A new, smaller brewery, bearing the Truman name, sells their beer here you can end up with an inexpensive Sunday lunch from one of the many ethnic stalls and cafes around the brewery yard or lining the street. Historically and in films, the East End has been associated with crime and we all remember the Artful Dodger. So today, in these crowded streets, do we still have to watch out? I always advise people, particularly tourists when they come over here, please be careful of their money because basically there are people who might take advantage and I don't like hearing it, I don't like seeing it as well on the streets of London because those visitors are kind enough to come to London so we should support them in every way we can as Londoners to help them, to guide them through our capital city because it's a wonderful city and we haven't got Jack the Ripper around every corner in the East End of London because a lot of tourists amazingly think that we've still got fog in the streets, we've still got Jack the Ripper riding around the corner. A um, very old city, obviously. I must admit, you've got lovely mince pies. Right? Now, when I say mince pies, I'm talking about your eyes. Right? And you, madam, also have lovely Amsterdam. When you say you've got a lovely set of Hampsteads, Hampstead Heath is a, is a big park in London and we named it after Cockney Rhyme is Slang, his teeth. When you use the Cockney Rhyme is Slang, obviously, to short circuit the words, like you go into a pub and you're going to have a gin, people say, give us a Vera, a Vera Lynn, gin. Yeah. Yeah? But a lot of people don't use it now, sadly, because it was called a secret language, that's why it's called slang. Oh. So it's the first words of secret language, yes. yeah. slang. Yeah. And the slang words was used by the market traders in, in London mm. to confuse the police. Oh. Right? Because when you're talking about, you, I could say to somebody, cool, look at that bird walking down the old rough frog and toad there. She you not know, got a lovely bit of tomfoolery on. Now when I say tomfoolery, that means jewellery. 
so we call Tom Foolery Jewelry, you know, but it was used to confuse the police in Victorian times, and the police didn't understand the way the costermongers of London was talking, Yeah. so they had to send their police on these courses to learn Cockney rhyming slang. Doreen, can you tell us about the traditions and the history of the Curly Kings and Queens? Of course, of course. Uh, our founder is named Henry Croft. He was a workhouse boy from Summertown, near King's Cross, and he worked alongside the costermongers, the market sellers, as we're here in a market today, and he was a road sweeper. And he saw that the, the costermongers looked after their own. You're talking about a community where you had a place of worship, a hospital, a market, similar to what we have today, and these people would help each other if they couldn't work, or they would go into the community, help the local hospital, and as a young road sweeper, he was only 13 when he went out to work, that is what he did. He admired the costermongers, saw that they trimmed their outfits with pearl buttons to attract customers to come over and buy their wares, and uh, he decided to join the costermongers, help them, and then found the, the pearly movement. What charities do you collect for? Oh, right. Ah, oh, that's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said that. Well, we're the Pearly King and Queen Society. We're a registered charity in our own right. Uh, and what we do is we only collect once a month here in, in um, Cheshire Street, Brick Lane, and Covent Garden third weekend in the month. And that all goes into our charity fund. And at the end of the year, we sit round a table and we decide who we would like the money to go, to go to. And that's the idea of the Pearly Kings and Queens. We give our services free to any charity that wants our support. And we want to get away from the old image of the Pearly Kings and Queens and the Costamangas. We aren't knees up Mother Brown <laughs> and drinking a pint of beer and going up the old apples. Uh, we want to be recognised as charity workers and I have brought for you to see last year I was given the British Empire medal oh. and on June the 5th I shall be at a garden party with the Queen at back oh, in the palace <laughs> so it's nice to know we don't expect to be recognized I mean I've been doing it over 20 years the pearly it took a long time to get an award <laughs> But you don't do it for that, but it's always yeah. nice to be recognised the fact that you do take time off to help the community and Henry Croft would have been proud of all of our group. <laughs> Brick Lane Sunday Market began in the 17th century when farmers from Essex first came here to sell their produce. How times have changed! art in London is incredibly dynamic and changes every day with older pieces gone over by new artists or buffed away by the council. Here is a large concentration of work by local artists and international ones who feel drawn to this area. Originally an antisocial crime, the last decade has illustrated just how far good street art has become accepted. It's now respected as a genuine art form by institutions and galleries all across London. Banksy, one of the early pioneers in the 1990s, was commissioned to paint a car here and you can still see it behind Perspex in the brewery yard. There are other examples of his witty social comment preserved in different parts of London. If you want more, it's best to join a street art tour. There are many to choose from in undiscovered and unusual London. Perhaps the most striking for us is the mural by Jim Vision on Hanbury Street. It's located on the wall of the Bangla Town Cash and Carry. Though this was a personally led project, Jim was advised by the shopkeeper that a piece of art relevant to the local community would be gratefully received. 
Having enjoyed three Sunday markets today, Dave and I are hungry and go in search of an authentic East End curry in Bangletown. Only problem is, there are 45 restaurants to choose from and all of them claim that they are the best in Brick Lane. our visit to London's East End, in complete contrast we've taken the tube to Green Park in the West End, which is the most popular portal to visit Royal London. Now if you've just been to Buckingham Palace and you're wondering where to go next, how about this little jaunt? to see some curiosities down some very exclusive streets between St James's and Piccadilly. St James's Street leads directly to St James's Palace, which was commissioned by Henry VIII and finished in 1536 with a distinctive red brick Tudor style. Through the centuries, it's been the location for some of the most important events in the royal family's history and is still the official residence of our sovereign. St James's Palace continues to remain a major part of royal life with its sumptuous apartments involved with state visits, ceremonial and formal occasions. With much royalty, embassies and members clubs on the doorstep, it's no surprise that there are some prestigious suppliers in St James's Street. Some of these shops are so old they were built on the site of King Henry VIII's tennis courts. At number three is Berry Brothers and Rudd, Britain's oldest wine and spirit merchant, still trading from the same shop since 1698. They hold a wine school with exclusive fine wine and dining here and are honoured to hold two royal warrants for Her Majesty the Queen and His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. With over 5,000 wines for sale, their historic cellars extend for some distance beneath and behind the shop. Curiosity gets the better of me. I have to go down here. The passage opens into the smallest public square in London, Pickering Place. It's named after William Pickering, an early in-law and shop owner of the wine merchant family. As well as being the backyard of Berry Brothers and Rudd, this square was once notorious for its alleged gambling dens, bear baiting and duels. But number three, St James's Street, has another tale to tell. Between 1842 and 1845, it housed perhaps its most unusual tenant, because the upper story of the wine merchant became briefly the home of the Embassy of the Republic of Texas. This short-lived diplomatic outpost was closed when Texas reluctantly became one of the United States of America. The establishment left without paying its final rental instalment. But an honest representative returned in 1986 to repay the debt 140 years overdue. Trading a few doors down this prestigious street is Lock & Company, established in 1676, even earlier than its neighbour. James and Mary Lock, with their four children, set up their shop here, which has become the oldest hatters in the world today. Lords and leaders made Lock their hatter of choice, and 340 years on, there's been a long line of prominent patrons. Admiral Lord Nelson, Beau Brummel, Theodore Roosevelt, Winston Churchill and Charlie Chaplin to name just a few. The shop at number nine is a mere youngster. Trading here for just 160 years, the John Lobb establishment still offers customers the freedom to create their own unique pair of handmade shoes or boots. Using traditional carved wooden lasts, the footwear is specifically made to their personal style. 
My modestly priced trainers take me to our next port of call along King Street. Christie's, the world-famous auctioneers who've been based here since 1823. Not everyone knows that this famous institution can be visited on weekdays for viewings and they often have prestige and museum quality pieces on display before auction day. St James's is often referred to as Clubland and has the highest concentration of long established and exclusive members clubs in London. Few of them have their names on the door and with their shutters drawn, they remain almost invisible to passers-by. A notorious member of these clubs has been immortalised in bronze down fashionable German Street. Now this is a wonderful statue of Beau Brommel, perhaps the first great dandy, and he was a close friend of the Prince Regent. He set the dress code for the day, and his connections with court, exclusive clubs and tailoring embody the spirit of St James's past and present. In the 18th and 19th centuries, his keen sense of fashion, insisting on precision tailoring and an immaculately tied cravat, made him a very influential figure in London. A witty character, he was known for his sayings. To be truly elegant, one should not be noticed. And, if people turn to look at you on the street, you are not well dressed but either too stiff, too tight, or too fashionable. Strategically posed at the entrance to the Piccadilly Arcade, Beau Brummel checks out today's high-priced male fashion. Dave and I have arrived in Piccadilly, which contains many more prestige shops. While I suggest we admire the ladies' fashion in Burlington Arcade across the road, Dave has already decided it's time to catch the tube to another interesting part of London. Nobody turns to look at us as we go. London's regenerated Docklands stretches for over eight square miles on both sides of the River Thames to the east of the city. Although the shiny development at Canary Wharf began in the early 80s, construction of many offices and homes still continues today in lesser known areas. Our outing is at Rotherhithe and then Wapping, two historic districts either side of the river. Dave and I set out from Canada Water Tube Station, situated on the edge of what was once Canada Dock. Many of the derelict docks have been either filled in, turned into a leisure area, or a nature reserve, like here at Canada Water. The Development Corporation was sympathetic to the Docklands' long and rich history, and pockets of atmospheric artifacts and interesting buildings have been spared demolition particularly in Rotherhithe. We meet Tim Thomas, a friend of the Brunel Museum here. This area is the naughty bit of London, and I love it. This is where all the pirates were, um, this is where all the brothels were, and the ladies who worked in the brothels were known as Winchester geese, because they were all run by the Bishop of Winchester who had a palace just up the river here. He was the chief pimp. He took a cut off the top. So this is a naughty bit of London. And that's why, you know, there was a time, and I'm sure you've been told this, that you're a good-looking bird. I'm sure you've been called a good-looking bird. That comes from Winchester geese. Oh, I didn't know that. Tim, is Rotherhithe a good place to come to for a grand day out? Oh, absolutely. You've got the river just here, and London really has always been about the river. There's lots of river traffic, things to see. There's the Mayflower pub, 
It's literally next door to the museum. You've got Sands Films, which is a world-leading place for making historical costumes. They did a lot of the costumes for Pirates of the Caribbean, and they even made a lot of the costumes for the Metropolitan Opera in New York, and that's a beautiful Georgian warehouse. We'll return to the museum later. First, Dave and I explore on a well-known walking trail along Rotherhithe Street. What appears to be a quaint back street is in fact two miles long, the longest street in London. This historic area has long been associated with the maritime industry and once many wharves and quays lined the River Thames here. There's been a pub around this spot on Rotherhithe Street since the 1550s. The first on record was known as The Ship, and it's been renamed and rebuilt several times over the centuries. Overlooking the river at the rear, this highly popular watering hole stands on a very important historical site. In the 1950s, the rector of St Mary's Church set out to investigate local claims that the famous Mayflower ship actually set out on its historic voyage to America, not from Plymouth, where the history books tell us, but from here, Rotherhithe. He found out that the Mayflower, built in Harwich, was later based in London and was used in the whaling industry and wine trade from France. From entries in the Port of London Customs Book, her captain was named as Christopher Jones, a Rotherhithe ship owner. The rector also discovered from his own parish records that the other three Mayflower owners and ship's mate Clark were also Rotherhithe men. The Pilgrim Fathers, who were persecuted in England, awaited passage here. It's been reported that in 1620, the then Puritan rector of St. Mary's gave them food and refuge in the church before starting their epic journey to preach their faith in the new world. So from this local research, there is little doubt that the famous ship began its historic and eventful journey from right here on this piece of foreshore in July 1620. Of the 65 passengers on board, not all were religious pilgrims. There was an assortment of courageous hopefuls, all members of the Virginia Merchant Adventurers Company. In fact, in order to gain passage on the Mayflower, the pilgrims had to join this company and became little more than onboard servants during the voyage. This historic site, known as Cumberland Wharf, is remembered with a garden, a curious statue and an information board telling how the Mayflower began its journey from here. Firstly to Southampton, to take on supplies and team up with a troublesome sister ship, and then finally crossing the Atlantic from Plymouth in September with a prosperous wind. And as they say, the rest is history. It's really tempting to look for something from that time, isn't it? I know, it's called mudlarking. That's a good name for it, actually. <laughs> yeah. But you have to have a licence and you have to report it if you find anything because it could be of archaeological importance. Mm, it's a shame, isn't it? Well, it's such a historic river. Yeah, you can't take it home. No. This part of the Thames, of course, is tidal. Today, a more serious mudlarking team from the Museum of London have a couple of hours to investigate and record this historic foreshore before the water rises. This wonderful piece of slimy carpentry is a windlass from a sailing ship. You can survey all this from the relaxing terrace of the Mayflower pub. Inside, there are constant reminders of the iconic ship and its famous voyage. Not surprisingly, there are many visitors here from the USA. Interestingly, this is the only pub we know of licensed to sell postage stamps for the UK and the US.
back in the 1800s, when the pub was called the Spread Eagle, seafarers docking at Rotherhithe had little time to spare, let alone post a letter, but they were able to order food, a pint, and a postage stamp here. You can still ask for one at the bar today. You have to wonder how many times within these walls tales have been told of the little ship of just 180 tons that battled across the Atlantic carrying the Pilgrim Fathers. But what of the Mayflower's captain, Christopher Jones? Rather Hythe had two social centres at that time, the pub and the church. The parish records tell a sad story. He died at the age of just 52. So in 1622, Jones was finally laid to rest somewhere here in what was the old churchyard, less than two years after the historic voyage of the Mayflower. Although there isn't a gravestone left to see, there is a memorial and a plaque in the church. Another landmark in the area is the Rotherhithe Tunnel under the Thames, Opened in 1908, very much in the heyday of the former Docklands, it was originally intended for horse-drawn traffic. But progress couldn't be halted, and it steadily became overrun with motor vehicles, and is still heavily congested today. Now this wasn't the first tunnel under the Thames. Much earlier, in the 19th century, a brave project began. The road names and signs in Rotherhithe give you a clue to who engineered the masterpiece. Close to the Mayflower Inn, there is a private museum dedicated to its constructors. Very near here, in fact beneath my feet, you've got the first tunnel under a river anywhere in the world built between 1825 and 1843 and the building behind me was the pumping station that they used to pump the water out and the tunnel under my feet was built by a genius called Mark Isambard Brunel the father of Isambard Kingdom Brunel probably the greatest engine in the world at that time the Thames was so congested on any one day of the week you would have found at least 3,000 tall masted cargo ships desperately trying to land cargo at the right place and there was also a lot of piracy believe it or not more piracy here than there was in the Caribbean it was chaos and so Mark Isambard came up with this genius plan of building a tunnel under a river big enough to take horses and carts to carry cargo from one side of the river to the other get it to the right place they would charge a penny a load it wouldn't add to the congestion, and they reckoned they could make a profit. And so in order to do that, he had to kind of rewrite all the rules of engineering. For example, on my right here is the, what we call the Grand Entrance Hall, and that was the shaft that they sank to build the tunnel. You have to go down to the level where you want to do your tunnelling. The first caisson shaft ever sunk in the world. Now they set about building the tunnel but they had all sorts of problems. At one point they ran out of money quite early on and young Isambard Kingdom Brunel, and it was his first job working under his father, aged 19, came up with a publicity stunt. He invited all the richest people in London to come to an event in the tunnel. And in the tunnel was the band of the Grenadier Guards playing God Save the King. And they were amazed that they were going to have a banquet under the River Thames. It raised the money. The other reason it took so long is there was a constant fear of flooding. And on one notorious occasion, three men had drowned and they were fearful that Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the son of the overall boss, had also drowned. But luckily for him, at the last minute, the foreman of the day, his best friend, came through at the top of the shaft, looked down, and suddenly the whole shaft was full of water. And on the surface, as it surged up, was Isambard Kingdom Brunel, unconscious. The foreman grabbed him by the arm, pulled him to safety, but the young man already had a lungful of Thames water, which in those days was no joke. And for the rest of his life, he had chest complaints because of that one incident. But the first thing he had done, he was rowed out to the middle of the River Thames. This is Isambard, the son. He was put in a diving bell. He was lowered down to the bed of the river, 
He looked around, he found the hole where the water was coming in, he put sandbags in the hole and he fixed it. They pulled him back out, but he was ill, I can tell you. Tim, what can we see in the museum? In the pumping station, which is now the main museum, on the top floor, you've got basically a history of the making of the tunnel. Um, they planned to do it in three years. It took 18 years, because first of all, they kept running out of money, and secondly, there was a constant fear of flooding. But they managed to achieve what they set out to after 18 years. So on the top floor, you've got a history of that. A totally revolutionary, uh, uh, an epoch-making piece of engineering. Amongst the display of commemorative merchandise for the eighth wonder of the world is a curious peep show. Fascinating. Beneath, you've got a film running about the life of the sun, Isambard Kingdom Burrell, the greatest engineer who ever lived. He built ships, railways, he built the lot. And just a little bit further down the river from here, Isambard Kingdom Burrell, at the end of his life, launched a ship called the SS Great Eastern, five times bigger than any ship that had ever been built before. And it was so big, 700 feet long, they couldn't launch it across the river because one end would have hit the far bank before the back was free. So they had to launch it sideways. It got stuck. There was an explosion. He had a heart attack and they took him home and that's when he died aged 53. So he never saw the launching of the Great Eastern. But in the lower floor, you've got a pictorial representation of that. Um, in the shaft itself, you can go down halfway down the shaft, uh, but they put a floor in uh, a couple of years ago, and now we have events there. Um, I give talks down there. Uh, we've had concerts down there. I don't know if you're interested, but I sing in a band, and we've done gigs down there, and the acoustics are wonderful. On the top of this shaft here, there is a beautiful garden. And at weekends, you can come to what's called the Midnight Apothecary, which is a cocktail bar, a pop-up cocktail bar. Now, what many Londoners don't know is that this famous 175-year-old tunnel is still in use today. In 1869, it was converted to carry the East London Railway. Nowadays, on what is now the London Overground Line, around 14 million passengers travel through it each year. Many don't even realise it. Now it's our turn to go underneath the Thames, although Dave thinks overground isn't quite the right word for it. You don't get long to experience the eighth wonder of the world, it's just 1,300 feet long, running at a depth of 75 feet below the river at high tide. The historic importance of the tunnel was recognised in 1995 when this amazing feat was listed as a Grade II monument. We alight at the historic station of Wapping, just one stop north of Rotherhithe. However, the platform is a bit short you have to be careful which carriage you travel in. It looks like it's leaking. No, it can't be, can it? Wapping Station was built inside the original north access shaft and was refurbished about ten years ago to show off the amazing brick construction from the past. It's still hard to believe that the 175-year-old tunnel carries thousands upon thousands of people every day. It's a real testament to the Brunel's extraordinary engineering. Now we walk out into Wapping High Street, a different part of London's Docklands, where there are many large warehouses full of apartments and offices, some well-established, some quite recent restorations. Dave assures me that the best history is in all the pubs on this side of the Thames, so we make a beeline for one of the oldest in London, the Prospect of Whitby, currently named after a ship from the Tyne, which used to moor here in the early 19th century. But the pub is far older than that. In fact, 
fact, it lays claim to being the site of the oldest riverside tavern in London, dating from around 1520. So, 400 years ago perhaps, from here, you could have seen the Mayflower sailing up the Thames. The pub was once known as the Pelican, and access to the waterfront was down a narrow set of steps or stairs. These were once watermen's stairs, where passengers might get picked up or dropped off, seeking transport across or along the Thames. There are several of them preserved in Wapping. The tide is still out, so we can explore. This rather gruesome site is, of course, a recent addition to the shore, but it's still a reminder of Execution Dock near here, which was used for over 400 years to execute pirates, smugglers and mutineers, all sentenced to death by the Admiralty Court. Tradition was upheld that their bodies would be left dangling until they had been submerged three times by the tide. It makes you shudder. Close to the prospect of Whitby is the Shadwell Basin. It's now one of the most significant bodies of water surviving from the historic London docks. Many, of course, have been filled in. The basin lay derelict from the late 1960s, but by 1987, the London Docklands Development Corporation commissioned a waterside complex here. The residential buildings are three to five storeys, echoing the scale of traditional 19th century dockside warehouses. Dave and I make our way back into historic Wapping. Garnet Street, now that rings a bell. Do you remember that TV comedy, Till Death Us Do Part? Yeah, that was set in Wapping, wasn't it? Yeah. Johnny Spate, the writer, must have named Alf Garnet after the street. Yeah, he was a bit non-PC, wasn't he? He was the most non-PC person ever. You know, when the series was made, this was all a deprived area of London's Docklands. Yeah, look at it now. Flats are worth a million. <laughs> I know. But I like the way they've kept all the original ironwork and stuff. Quite peaceful now, and certainly gentrified, Wapping was not so in the 1980s. As part of the redevelopment of this area, News International's newspaper operation moved from their traditional Fleet Street headquarters to new £80 million premises in Wapping. Over 5,000 print workers were sacked when new technology was introduced. Violent trade union protests followed and the incident became known as the Battle of Wapping. Romantics prefer to remember a much earlier past, imagining the old warehouses that were stuffed full of spice, fruit, nuts, oils, wine, hops and tea. Apparently the dock workers and sailors used to be able to tell exactly where they were at night just by the smell of the produce. Expecting to be steered into another pub, Dave mentions that this one is in fact a 1980s establishment, but built inside an historic warehouse. Captain Kidd is named after one of history's most notorious plunderers, William Kidd, who was eventually hanged hereabouts at the notorious gallows, Execution Dock. And so our trail in the Docklands ends here at, yes, another pub, next to another historic flight of stairs the town of Ramsgate. Formerly named after a barmaid here, the Red Cow was a known watering hole for a certain Judge Jeffreys in the 17th century. A confirmed royalist, he went into hiding when the parliamentarian revolt overthrew King James II. The infamous hanging Judge Jeffreys, who'd been known to sentence 200 people to death in one sitting, had a last drink in the pub before attempting to flee to Europe by ship. He was grabbed by a lynch mob on whopping old stairs in 1688. From here, he was taken to the Tower of London for his own safety. 
and there he died a year later, aged 40, not by execution, but reputedly from a painfully large kidney stone brought on by excessive drinking. There are many more gruesome tales to discover in London's historic docklands. Next, we head for somewhere with a more civilised past. is the deepest in the whole of London. At 192 feet below the High Street, it's our starting point for a lovely day out in Hampstead. Doors closing. Please have your tickets ready. The old fire station and clock tower mark the original centre of the town, although many prefer to call the London suburb of Hampstead a village. Certainly its leafy lanes and country-style mansions could pass for a rural spot in the home counties, but there's nothing remotely resembling a village shop in the high street. We are in fact only four and a half miles from the centre of London. Hampstead first gained popularity as a fashionable spa over 300 years ago. Health ponds and wells were enlarged above the town to take advantage of the iron-rich spring water. In the days when smallpox, cholera and tuberculosis were rife in the city, the wealthy could build their mansions on the hillside here and take in the clean air and a fine outlook. A number of benevolent institutions and trusts built hospitals and baths in the vicinity. So what was once a little village with a population of just 600 grew rapidly and by 1800 it had become an exclusive suburban town flanked by the still undeveloped and protected Hampstead Heath. Dave and I are taking a round walk out of the centre and onto the heath to see some of the most exclusive houses and estates in London, with of course a couple of curiosities thrown in. It's about four miles. It's said there are more commemorative plaques here in Hampstead than anywhere else in London. Writers, authors, poets, artists, stars, philanthropists, musicians, all found these village-like surroundings extremely agreeable and no doubt extremely expensive. Church Row is considered to be the best preserved Georgian street in the whole of London. It was once described as an avenue of Dutch red-faced houses leading demurely to the old church tower that stands guarding its graves in the flowery churchyard. St John at Hampstead is the parish church. This atmospheric and perhaps creepy churchyard is often referred to as the tomb with a view. Writer Bram Stoker was almost certainly thinking of this place when he wrote his famous novel Dracula in 1897 for part of the story was based in Hampstead. It's where vampire Lucy rose from her grave at night to feed upon children she found on Hampstead Heath. This is also the place where many of the town's rich and famous residents have been laid to rest, as far as we know. The graveyard, which spreads from both sides of the road, contains so many mature trees, it's hard to imagine that we're in the highest town in London. We climb the hill. Actress Dame Judi Dench and author Robert Louis Stevenson lived in these parts. This was once the Mount Vernon Hospital for the treatment of consumption and diseases of the chest. 
the holly bush was known to the likes of Dickens and Dr. Johnson, and no doubt many other writers and celebrities who would come to imbibe under the gas lamps of the pub. Handsome 17th century Fenton House, with its 300-year-old walled garden, is run by the National Trust. You can see stunning views of the City of London from the balcony and discover hidden treasures and collections of early musical instruments and ceramics. Not on our walk, but another good place to visit is the Keats House, where the poet John Keats lived from 1818 to 1820. He was a victim of consumption or tuberculosis, and like many, he took refuge in the clean surroundings of Hampstead. The house is now a museum dedicated to his life and work and is the setting that inspired some of his most memorable poetry. Also not to be missed is number two Willow Road. It's another National Trust property you can visit. Although it appears to be a house from the 1950s or 60s, it was built as far back as 1939 to groundbreaking plans by architect Erno Goldfinger who forged a new pathway for modern design. The artistic atmosphere of Hampstead in the 1930s is reflected in this house, and there have been other controversial dwellings built in the town since then. On we go on our trail, up and out of the town, past the Du Maurier's former residence. Built around 1700, the Admiral's House is so called after an eccentric naval lieutenant, Fountain North. He had the rooftop built to resemble the deck of a ship and would fire a cannon from there on special occasions. Behind the iron railings is a curious Hampstead landmark. This is one of the few, if not the only, observatory in London to provide for public viewing of the stars on clear Friday and Saturday nights in the winter. So Dave and I have reached the highest point in Hampstead, the Whitestone Pond. Buried in the bushes nearby is the Whitestone itself, a very old milestone where you can barely make out the lettering. A familiar sight here is Jack Straw's Castle, once a famous London pub and certainly the highest. It's now been converted into exclusive apartments on its upper floors. Our footloose trail leads us into the famous Hampstead Heath, once the domain of highwaymen like the infamous Dick Turpin. This western part is wonderful woodland, and if it wasn't for the distant sound of traffic, you could be forgiven for thinking you were in a deep forest. But it's still hard to believe we're not even five miles away from central London. Now this is a real surprise. You'd never known this was here, would you? Wow! The pergola is one of the hidden delights of Hampstead Heath and was the dream of William H. Lever, later Lord Leverhulme, a wealthy idealist, patron of the arts, architecture and landscape gardening. After buying the enormous Hill House in 1904, he set about landscaping the grounds. Construction began in 1905. Central to the project was to raise the hill gardens to the desired level. This required an army of workers. There were no mechanical earth diggers or movers then. Furthermore, a vast amount of material was needed. As chance would have it, the Hampstead extension of the underground was being built at the same time. The contractors urgently needed somewhere to dump the spoil from excavations of the tunnels. It wasn't long before there were thousands of wagon loads of that spoil lumbering their way up the hill. Astute Lord Leverhulme was paid a nominal fee per wagon for accommodating the very material he needed to landscape his dream. Masterminding the work was Thomas Mawson, a civic architect of some repute. 
After a number of alterations and extensions, this glorious project was finally finished in 1925, just before Lord Leverhulme died. After the Second World War, the hill garden and pergola had fallen into disrepair. It was then that the City Council took on the mammoth task of ownership and restoration. So today we can all enjoy this dream garden once more, just as it was created almost a century ago. These days, Hampstead doesn't attract the huge number of tourists that it used to. From Victorian times, Appy Hampstead was a large draw for the working class Cockney population of Lannan. On eye days and holidays, it was traditional to have a grand day out or a beano in the country. Many would come to the heath and seek out the local pubs here. Perhaps the most well known is the old Bull and Bush, which had a music license, immortalised in song by music hall artist Florrie Ford. The clientele has changed just a little in the past century. And so have the prices. Right, all right, can we use up then? Yeah. Yeah. Come, come, come and make eyes at me down at the old bull and bush. Da, 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 da. Come, come, drink port wine with me down at the old bull and bush. Talk about the shade of the sheltering pine. Dave and I continue our micro beano through what is known as the North End. There's a little nook down here, old Hampstead Town. After entering what resembles a country lane, then crossing more woodland, we emerge at Spaniards Road. From here, there's a footpath to Kenwood, a fine country mansion to visit. It's an 18th century masterpiece, remodelled by Robert Adam and managed by English Heritage. Yeah, OK. But with so many things to see, it's getting late on our day out. So Dave and I find another path to sample more of Hampstead Heath and its health ponds. Almost 500 years ago, in 1524, Hampstead Heath became a refuge for Londoners. Astrologers had predicted that a great flood would submerge the city. After reading this on pamphlets made on the newly developed printing presses, 20,000 citizens abandoned their homes and many came up here to watch the predicted devastation. However, on the actual Day of Judgment, it didn't even rain. The astrologers concerned hastily recalculated and found that their prediction was actually a hundred years too soon. Time enough for everyone to forget the whole thing. One refuge you might need on the heath is this half-timbered cottage buried in the darkest reaches. It's actually a public convenience. It's amazing to think that despite many attempts over several centuries to build on this exclusive piece of countryside, it still remains unspoilt and free for everyone to enjoy. It's interesting to know that these small outlets from the health ponds form the tributaries of the Fleet, London's most well-known lost river. This intriguing waterway flows underground for most of its journey to the Thames, but that's another story. Our day out is almost over, and we start the descent into Hampstead Town. there's one curiosity left to see, the parish lockup. As the town rapidly grew in size in the 1700s, crime also followed suit. This single cell was built into the wall of the courthouse to detain prisoners. 
Surprisingly, in recent times, a house has been built behind and the lock-up serves as its front door. It's been quite a hot day and we're both in need of refreshment. Typically, Dave steers me away from potential high expenditure and leads me to the flask. An Irish band plays while we plan our next outing in London. Our next destination is along one of London's best-known streets, the Strand. It's only a short walk from Temple Tube Station and an even shorter walk from Fleet Street. Now by far the largest building here is the Royal Courts of Justice, built in grand Victorian Gothic style. But right opposite is probably the smallest premises on the Strand, and it's also a listed monument, Twinings, the oldest tea shop in London. It's almost a museum inside, the shelves are packed with teas from around the world and above are portraits depicting generations of the Twining family who've run the business. Unbelievably, Corporate Relations Director Stephen Twining represents the 10th generation today. I meet Julia, the store's senior brand ambassador. The shop that you're standing in now was um, opened in 1706 as Tom's Coffee House. So not many people realise, but we actually did start in coffee. Even though we're so synonymous with tea nowadays, at this point in London, we were mainly drinking coffee. There are about 2,000 coffee houses around the centre of London, and tea was sort of nowhere to be seen at this point. It was maybe just starting to come into England in about sort of 1650s. And Thomas Twining basically decided through his connections with the East India Company to start selling a small amount of tea in the shop as well that people could come and drink but also they could take small amounts of it home with them and this is quite groundbreaking at the time. So by, by having this he actually ended up selling his tea to other coffee houses as well so he was very business savvy in the very very first generation, it's quite extraordinary and we're still here today and where you can see behind me this section basically was Tom's coffee house. Thomas Twain then started to do very, very well in his business as a whole, and tea was really what was taking off. And by 1717, we had a doorway onto the Strand properly. Um, and this is referred to as the Golden Lion, so that celebrated its 300th anniversary last year. That's the baby of the shop, if you like. And that's why it's a very, very long, thin corridor, because Thomas Twining basically kept buying houses until he had a doorway on the Strand. Now this is very important because it put us in a much more prestigious location in London because even though this is after the Great Fire of London and all the very, very wealthy families had moved out of the centre, they still came here to do their shopping. So by having that doorway on the Strand, it meant that everybody knew that Twinings was the place to go and actually get your tea from. And what he started to notice when he had the doorway on the Strand was actually his best customers were women. And this is something that he'd never even thought of before because when it was still a coffee house, women were not allowed to enter. But he started seeing carriages parking outside the front of the shop and male servants coming in and buying the tea for the ladies of the house. And Thomas realised if he could allow women to come into the shop, then he stood to make a great deal more money, we'll say, and actually had the business take off fully. So he referred to the shop instead of Tom's Coffee House as the Golden Lion Tea and Coffee House. And from then on, it meant that women were allowed to enter. It meant it's a little bit more um, uh, dignified for ladies to come and do her shopping. And at this point, there would be huge chests of tea all around the shop, and the ladies would come and smell the different teas, and either buy small amounts to take home themselves, because blending in the home happened from the very beginning, or Thomas would blend them specific blends just for them as well. So it was really a very exciting time for tea. And if you could afford to buy tea, because tea at this point was so incredibly expensive, it's 119% tax upon the price of tea, which if you think about it, um, maybe like 100 grams of sort of classic gunpowder green tea would have sold for 180 pounds in today's money in the shop. So very, very expensive. So if you could afford to have tea, you would have a craftsman make you a beautiful tea caddy 
and you would keep it locked away so the servants couldn't go anywhere near it. Um, you didn't trust them to make your tea for you. And even though it was mainly for tea, later on when sugar became very expensive, sugar was locked away with it as well. But the lady of the house made the tea herself. It was never seen as a chore, never at all. What can customers do in the shop today? Well, the shop is open seven days a week and what we do is we actually have a tea bar at the back of the shop. Now, unless the tea bar is closed for a private masterclass, we have it open for the customers to come and taste any tea they would like in the shop at all. We have about 150-ish teas in the shop for you to taste and all of our premium loose leaf tea is only sold in this shop or on our UK and Ireland website and we give you opportunities to taste all of it at the tea bar. We make sort of iced mocktails, um, which I cold infuse, try and make it as special as possible. We also have a museum at the back of the shop. We have some artifacts in there. We have our Royal Warrant from Queen Victoria from 1837. We have a variety of different tea caddies and some history on the Twining family. Because Twining secured a Royal Warrant many years ago, it's natural to see commemorative blends displayed on the shelf. And here's a familiar box from the past. A tip placed in here first was to ensure promptness. There isn't enough time for me to take a masterclass, but Julia has invited me to choose one of their premium teas from around the world to taste. Mango and ginger. Oh, gosh, that's strong. After some deliberation, I settle on one of Twining's best-known blends, Earl Grey. So I'll put one teaspoon in here, because this is our international tasting china. Mm -hmm. We can get to slurp it in a bit. So we tend to get the water just below the boil. We don't really want it to be at boiling point. There's a theory that actually what you could do is you end up burning the tea leaves as a whole, or it ends up reducing the amount of sort of um, amino acids and chemicals and things that you naturally have in the water and you lose them through the steam so you don't get such a nice cup of tea. Again, uh -huh. that's something I always insisted on yeah. kettle must boil. So if I put up here and I'll set the timer. So we say sort of between three and four minutes for a black tea is quite nice. So then we have the taste chai, so we let it brew. So you don't play with it, you don't stir it. So this is loose leaf, so yeah. loose leaf we let brew for maybe three to four minutes for black tea. If it was a tea bag, I'd say two to three minutes. Oh, okay. Most people tend to let it maximum 30 seconds <laughs> brew for, and then they just want to take it out as quickly as possible. And we don't trust the tea bag. So everyone has to stir the tea bag and squeeze it against the side. The yes. tea bag has been designed in a way to brew perfectly. And it was designed as far back as 1908 by accident by a gentleman called Thomas Sullivan, who's an American merchant, who used to actually pop his tea leaves into tiny little pouches to send them. And people not realising this popped it straight into the pot. So that's where the tea bag first came okay, from. Okay, I can see that. Yeah. Yes. But the best thing, I think, is actually, look at things like this. This is a type of Earl Grey that we blended, more for an international market. It's got lemon peel in it as well. But this is a loose leaf but it's actually put into like a little silky mesh bag. Yes. So that means you have the best of both worlds. So you can brew it as a loose leaf tea, mm. but then you don't have any of the difficulty of being like, well, what do I do with the tea leaves? How do they strain mm. as you pop it in, you let it infuse, and then you throw it away. They do say as well that as soon as you sort of have um, boiled up or below the boil with your kettle, as soon as you then add it to a teapot, it cools it down. As soon as you then add it to your teacup, it cools it down again as well, because you're putting it oh, in different okay. vessels. Yes. So warming the pot as a whole is probably quite a good idea. Um, and that's a nice tradition. Mm. But the tradition of one for the pot is not a nice tradition. <laughs> not, okay. Because that, I think, just ends up making it very bitter. Mm -hmm. um, it's not ideal, really. Now for the slurp. Because what you want to do is you want to try and get it into the back of your taste buds. Mm -hmm. And then the best thing to do is if you hold it in your mouth just for a second and let it sort of sit on your tongue and then swallow. I was always taught not to smoke. I know. So You're allowed to here, just here. <laughs> That's very good. And can you see how you get more of this feeling on your tongue, either if it's slightly drying or oily, you get all of the bergamot at the back of your taste buds? I would say I, that was smoother. That was, yes, I, I would not have been able, without you telling me, that, that yeah. there was oil there. but. Now you've told me, yes. I you have all that flavour. 
Well, I've certainly learned something today. Thanks, Julia. Perhaps one of the best things about Twining's flagship store on the Strand is you can take home a rather elegant gift, which is nowhere near the price it was 300 years ago. And so to the last destination in our film. Behind me is number 20 Fenchurch Street, known to just about everybody as the walkie-talkie. But not everyone knows there is a garden on the very top and it's free public access, but you do have to book a ticket online ahead. Dave and I have got ours, so here we go. The walkie-talkie building is a few minutes from Monument Tube Station and its unique shape has enthralled many visitors to London. It was designed in 2004 by Raphael Vignoli from New York. Without increasing the building's footprint, he successfully reversed the idea that buildings had to be smaller at the top. Completed in 2014, it provides 690,000 square feet of office space with floor plates that become larger in size as the building ascends. Creating an urban experience at the top makes it all the more remarkable and they've put in a dedicated Sky Garden Express lift for visitors. The first thing you see is a stunning image of the Shard across the river. This unique public space opened in January 2015 and occupies three storeys, offering uninterrupted 360 degree views across the city. Visitors from all nations wander around the exquisitely landscaped greenery and observation decks of London's highest public garden. There are two exclusive restaurants here, a terrace lounge and two bars. Both will serve you a cocktail. It's such a good idea on top of the building. Instead of having the pipes and the air conditioning and all the rubbish that goes on top, to have a garden. You can eat, you can have a drink, and it's free. It's a public space. From our elevated position on the 35th floor, we see other roof gardens in the city, but they're not a patch on this one. So it's going to be cold in the winter and hot in the summer? Well, if they're tropical plants, they're going to have to keep it warm here. The garden designers opted for a series of richly planted terraces, each with a different theme. Tree ferns and fig trees recreate a lush prehistoric forest whilst Mediterranean and South African flowers suggest a sinuous mountain ravine. Individual plants have been chosen to work in harmony with the particular quality of light found under the roof canopy and will flourish all year round. Facing the River Thames is the fabulous open-air terrace. One hour time limit is almost up. Dave and I enjoy a last look at the major sites of London and wonder just how many curiosities and undiscovered parts there are still to find in the streets and alleys below. This was our selection and we hope you'll discover more for yourselves the next time you visit London. <laughs>